Now, the rest of the story. It's been going on for a week now. Police officers have been parked along a California highway, the one connecting Glendale and Los Angeles. Each morning he's had his eye on the same speeder. Same fellow, driving the same black roadster, surely as fast as the car would go. But so far, no luck in catching him. Monday, he was taken by surprise. Tuesday, the police car stalled. Wednesday, the officer had already stopped another speeder. Thursday, he was parked in the other direction and could not turn around fast enough. Uh Aha! But now, it's Friday, and the officer is ready, and he is parked at an intersection where all traffic must stop, and he is waiting. And sure enough, at 7.15, he hears the familiar roar of the approaching black roadster, brakes squealing, the car stops at the intersection, At last, the officer has his man. Well, he has a boy, really, much younger than he had appeared in a blur. And the young fellow is now very frightened. Where, says the policeman gruffly, where is the fire? The boy smiles uncomfortably. Name? The young man manages to stammer that his name is Eilard. He works for a newspaper. All this week he's been late for his job. Maybe the long hours are getting to him. You going to give me a ticket, he asks. The policeman scratches his chin, sizing up the situation, and he says, he says, no, not this time. But the boy's relief is premature because, you see, the officer has an alternative punishment in mind. You're going to San Jose day after tomorrow, he says. Sunday? That's right, Sunday, the policeman answers. There's a racetrack in San Jose, usually more cars than drivers. What you're going to do is choose an unoccupied car, and you're going to drive out on that track, and you are going to get all of that speeding out of your system, and only then may you come back to the police station and get your own car. Because until then, that's where it's going to be impounded. So it was not a joke. It was not a bluff. The policeman impounded Eilard's black roadster. The youngster did go to San Jose that Sunday. And what happened was not at all what the officer had intended. Because when the boy got out on that racetrack, he loved it. He thought there was no place else he would ever, ever want to be. Now, fans of auto racing will remember one of the greats. He'd been gone 60 years now, almost to the day. But what a career had Ted Horn Ted Horn held 89 official American racetrack records, including the record for most consistent finishes in the Indy 500 until Al Unser. And you know what else? All through the 20th century, only he had ever won the National Driving Championship three years in a row. So racing fans know Eilard Theodore Ted Horn. Oh, they know Ted Horn. But you know that he would never have made it on the racetrack had he, age 16, not been stopped by a cop for speeding. Because now you know the rest of the story. And now the rest of the rest of the story. I want to tell you about another race Ted Horn competed in. It was Sunday, October 10th, 1948. Ted entered the 100-mile race nicknamed the Magic Mile at DeCoin Fairgrounds in DeCoin, Illinois. Each lap was a mile. About 5,000 spectators gathered to watch the race. As the race was about to begin, Ted's wife, Jerry, joined the spectators in the stand. Now, the race usually lasted about an hour and 15 minutes. Finally, the race began. Ted carefully but quickly shifted the gears in what was known as the Horn Maserati. The cars quickly reached speeds averaging 75 miles an hour. By the end of the first lap, Ted was in fifth place. He had 99 laps to go. Ted was more than just a good driver. He was a good mechanic and engineer. Many of the components on the car were redesigned and rebuilt by Ted 
or Cotton Henning, longtime racing mechanic and owner of the Horn Maserati. In the previous race, a 500 mile race, the eight cylinder engine failed to perform properly. Late in the race, the engine began to overheat. Following the race, Ted and Cotton disassembled the engine and learned that a saboteur had poured sand or some other abrasive substance in the oil. Now prior to the magic mile, Cotton and Ted made sure no one had access to the car. Through the first lap, Ted's car was performing spectacularly. In the second lap, Ted held his fifth place position through the first corner, through the second corner, down the straightaway, through the third corner, and then snap. When Ted was turning the fourth corner, one of his wheel spindles broke. Ted's car was out of control. In the crash that followed, Ted was thrown from his car and on to the racetrack. Ted lay motionless on the track. His car careened into another race car driven by Johnny Monts. The race was stopped and paramedics hurried to Ted and Johnny's aid. Spectators ran from the bleaches onto the racetrack to get a better look. Paramedics loaded the men onto stretchers and rushed them to Marshall Browning Hospital just a few miles away. Johnny was only slightly injured and was released from the hospital after being treated. Ted had a concussion, a fractured left leg, and his chest was crushed. Twenty minutes after his arrival, doctors announced that Ted was gone. Ted and his wife Jerry had only been married 17 days. Newspapers said the race was more or less a token appearance for Ted. He had already held the American Automobile Association Racing Championship for the third straight year. The Magic Mile, the 100-mile race at DeCoin, was eventually renamed the Ted Horn 100 in honor of Ted. The only racing goal that Ted set for himself that he was unable to achieve was winning the Indianapolis 500. In the previous nine Indy 500 races, Ted finished the race in the top four. Ted's earnings from those nine races totaled $55,000. He had been looking forward to trying again for the Indy 500 title in 1949. One journalist who knew Ted said all who met him were left with the lasting impression that he was a fine gentleman off the speedway as he was every inch a champion behind the steering wheel. There was only one Ted Horn, and it all started from a traffic stop. Many people credit Ted's winningness to the fact that he never gave up. When someone wished him luck, Ted's usual reply was, well, we'll be in there trying, we'll do our best. Those are words we could all live by. We'll be in there trying, We'll do our best. I'm Brad Dyson. Thanks for watching. And as Paul Harvey would say, good day.